Welcome to the Game Dungeon. Today we're Boppin. Boppin is a platforming puzzle game. Not to be confused with Bip Bop. We're not Bop Bippin' the Boop Beeps here, just Boppin. Okay, I may as well get this out of the way. If you're wondering, yes, the title of my website, Accursed Farms, is inspired by this game. I mean, look at this title. We're hit with Uga Chaka followed by a possessed teddy bear holding a plunger with purpose. This grabs my attention right away. This game actually has an alternate secret title you can activate which is a lot bloodier, but I don't think it's as good. I mean, the original has cold, dead eyes. You look at this screen and you wonder what's going to happen next. What is the agenda of this bear? I don't know. So we start the game and we actually get a somewhat lengthy story along with animated cutscenes. The short version is, your characters exist in sort of a video game multiverse, where they just chill out playing games. But one day, all the enemies disappear from their games, and next thing they know, all the local heroes are banging on their door. What's happened is, Sweetie Honey Buns, the singing treacle bear, has abducted all the enemies because he wants to remove everything offensive and make all the games politically correct. In their words, he's too pure and sweet even for us heroes. We're straight out of a job. And because these are heroes coming to you for help, they can't exactly be seen rescuing the bad guys, so they're contracting you to handle this covertly because you're too cool to worry about concepts like good or evil. And that's the backstory. We're here to rescue all the bad guys for the good guys from the self-righteous rabbit masquerading as the good guy. For a morally ambiguous game, this sure is bright and colorful, huh? So here's the game. The concept is pretty simple. You're given a block to pick up and fling it diagonally until you hit a matching one. If you match certain patterns, you get to free the monsters. Even though that's the whole point of the story, it doesn't actually matter aside from more points. You go through each level like this, but the rules change constantly and things aren't always as they seem. Like, hey, were you expecting that you could do this? Me neither. The levels really live up to the multiverse concept going on here. Sometimes you're in space, a circuit board, blueprint drawing, a factory, it just goes on and on. Now not every single level has a unique theme, but I want to say about 80 to 90% of them do. Speaking of which, let's jump straight to the music. The music in this game is unique. Even the beginning theme I feel like starts out like a real tune, but then the composer got a little drunk, but manages to recover. A lot of the beats in this game are like that. You think they're going to devolve into pure noise, like a cat walking on a piano, but then they recover and it sounds like something again. It gets into my head. I actually learned how to play most of this one on the piano. The music in this game gives me the feeling like the composers either aren't very good, or else are so good, they're geniuses beyond their time, and I'm just not sophisticated enough to fully grasp it. In any event, the music is interesting, and I can honestly say it's unlike any other music I've heard in a game. Now besides having 160 levels and a level editor, this game also has a two-player mode. Now I don't have a second person to test this out in, but in the legacy copy of the game like this, if you enter in a secret code, you can unlock a second player. Hey, look! It's Tom from the show Weird Video Games. Help. Hey, Tom. I'm reviewing Boppin'. Want to help me with the two-player mode? No. Oh. Well, why not? Because this is Boppin'. The title screen music could only have been constructed from a broken melodica in my nightmares. The rest of the music seems to range from acceptable to a flaming power drill applied directly to the vestibular nerve. The main characters are named Yeet and Boik. If this game wasn't made in Scandinavia, it was written by Doug Tenapel as he was hitting himself in the face with a bag of cutlery. Yeet is obviously the cooler one. I got lost trying to understand the instructions and just decided I'd figure it out on my own. This was a bad move on my part, as the first dozen levels or so had me in a caveman-like constant state of confused fear, failing constantly and not understanding why. This is a hugely unintuitive game that has a control scheme and physics that are not found in other video games, and it will take a while to retrain your brain to whatever strange reality this game resides in. I thought for a while that I just wasn't pressing the right buttons. 
I tried a bunch of different buttons, and when I hit shift, it brought up a menu, which, among other things, showed me what the controls are. Cool! There are two buttons, spacebar and shift. Oh, and shift just brings up the menu I already accessed. I had to press shift to access a menu to tell me what shift does, when all it does is bring up the menu I already found by pressing shift. My head feels like an infinity symbol. You have to press the button! So basically, spacebar does everything in this game. This took some getting used to. Then I'm wondering why when I connect a blue block to a pink rose, my hero starts crying. I know it's said in the instructions that you throw it, but even the most simple instructions with clearly labeled diagrams is a way of just making your mind go blank in this game. It's like if it told you that gravity in this game is clockwise. You might sort of understand it conceptually, but because it's so unlike anything you're used to, really the only way you're going to figure out what you're doing is by trying things and failing repeatedly. At least now I know that- wait, something just beamed me up. Oh, I got a game over- I died from that? I seriously didn't realize that you actually lose a life if you miss. Oh come on, that's not that unusual for a you puzzle- You lose a life if you miss! I thought my character was just crying, I didn't realize he was dying! So all this time I thought I was just learning the ropes, it turns out my life was in constant danger from even the slightest mistake. So yeah, once I knew what I was doing, I had moved on from confusion to annoyance to utter fury, as now I was forced to wade into incredibly frustrating situations where even a firm grasp on the rules of the game won't help you. This game is like occasionally getting sat on by a much bigger kid from school. He doesn't hit you or take anything, he just likes to remind you how truly powerless you really are. Tom, your head is round. You're not thinking like a triangle. So what am I supposed to match here? Oh, the box that says 1, and the box that says 2. Oh, and the arrow box is bounce stuff. Okay, that was confusing. In this level, the treasure looks exactly the same as the blocks. Tom does have a point in that consistency is not the name of this game. The levels like to switch things around where it's not clear what is the background, what are the blocks, which way they're going to bounce. Every level keeps you guessing. What are you even supposed to do in this level? Every attempt to throw a block into this big creature shape causes it to bounce off into the abyss. It was only after many lost lives that I realized, oh, this green thing is one of those directional blocks that shoots their bopping block to the right. How was I supposed to know that? Do you know how many times I died before I figured that out? It was more than this many. Nowadays, it's easy to spot flaws of games because there are so many examples to compare to, but maybe it's because I was younger when I played this, or because games were still evolving, there wasn't much of a basis of comparison. Looking back on this game now, I can see this is borderline trolling the player. A lot of levels will be straightforward, or a good puzzle, but then they'll throw one at you just to grief you. Like, the one that stands out for me is where you enter completely blind and have to fire black blocks against other black blocks in a black background. This is pure trial and error. This is not fun. This is a bad level. But before and after this, you have normal levels. So the game paces itself. It maintains this delicate balance of making the player frustrated, but not so much they just up and quit. Besides, you never know what is coming in the next level, so there's constantly this sense of wonder what's behind the next door. Level 16 does not have a visible border. Considering this game uses a wraparound feature where you can walk back and forth between the left and right side and shoot blocks off screen and have them come back on the other side, this is a nasty surprise, as now your shots will bank unexpectedly and hit the wrong blocks. Also, even once you know that there's a wall, it's incredibly hard to line up a good bank shot when you can't see where the wall actually is. This game has a consistency of watered-down margarine. Playing this again, I'm reminded of those insanely difficult Mario ROM hacks that are made from masochists. Boppin never comes close to taking it that far, but it likes to ever so lightly brush against the completely unfair surprises you'll have in those kinds of games. It's easy to get points, so it's never a soul-crushing setback, but Boppin really likes to test you. It's sort of like a really proactive Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland. Level 23 has a bunch of crates that look identical at first, but if you look really closely, the diagonal wooden panel faces in two different directions. You won't even notice until the first time you accidentally make an incorrect match. 
Also, everything this level follows a set path, but it's really hard to understand where your shots are going to go, so you will naturally make several mistakes no matter what. I do appreciate how you'll occasionally get really good puzzles in this game. I'm a fan of hard puzzles, and there are one or two in here that really slowed me down. This level especially. I like ones where you know what you have to do, you know the rules, you just have to figure out how to do it. And when it's not giving you really easy levels or trying to grief you, Boppin delivers. This one I thought was impossible. It took me forever to figure this one. Oh, actually, no, I didn't figure it out. Ross told me what to do. And I still didn't understand it even with more trial and error. That was ridiculous. I touched on it earlier, but I think the best parts of this game are the environments. Some are just typical, others they're spoofing famous games, others feel like they're on alien worlds. Look at that! What is that? A watermelon with four legs? In level 31, I'm afraid to do anything because I seriously can't tell what's an obstacle and what is scenery. Is that electrical current a wall, or can my objects pass through it? What about the science equipment generating that current? Can my bopping block go through that? I can't climb up there to see, so the only way to know is by hurling blocks through it and hoping I don't die. And hey, besides the environments, when you do free monsters, there's a lot of them. You have your standard fantasy ones and aliens, but then you have geometric shapes and businessmen. I freaking love the variety in this game. This game will frequently put you in positions where it is impossible for you to succeed. Sometimes you'll be left with a block that's sitting on the floor, which should be really easy, except you can't just place a bopping block down. You always throw them. So you'll have to use bank shots, bouncing it off a ceiling. Oh, unless there's no ceiling, or any possible angle in which you can bank it, in which case your block just flies out into space and then you die. And then it just spawns you another bopping block so you can do it again and again and never win. Even if there is a ceiling, sometimes there will be a treasure on top of the block which will bounce your bopping block away from the block. Did I mention that sometimes the blocks you need to match are buried under other blocks? And that the pattern in which the game gives you the blocks are set, so that they're always the same, meaning some of these levels were designed in such a way that it is impossible to match certain patterns right away and the game will give you the wrong blocks before there's any possible way you can use them? Some levels START you with a block that's impossible to match. And that means you have to sacrifice points OR LIVES right off the bat, because screw you, that's why. This is another episode where I want to encourage people to make some fan art for it. If you have an idea of what the next world should look like, or what monsters they should be freeing, go ahead and send it to me, maybe you can get featured in a follow-up episode later. The diversity on this game is just amazing. I get the feeling this looks like my unconscious mind. Like, people will talk about strange dreams, but guys, when I remember them, my dreams are really strange. Stuff like this. Next stop, Whateverland. Let's, Let's get, get boppin'. Then there are some levels that are some kind of miscellaneous plane of suffering that doesn't even get covered by all the above recurring problems. First, what's this cap square? It doesn't act like an elevator or anything. What is it? I seriously don't know what it is. That's the caps lock. This is a PC game, Tom. When I was playing this one, I ran out of lives and had to continue, and then I had multiple blocks that couldn't be used, forcing me to kill myself repeatedly. Finally, I got two good blocks I could use, followed by one I couldn't, and the points I got from these two matches STILL WEREN'T ENOUGH TO PREVENT ME FROM DYING FROM THE NEXT IMPOSSIBLE TO USE BLOCK! Eventually, I decided to look for a walkthrough, and found that it's impossible to find the solution to this level because the few people who did upload their walkthroughs and Let's Plays of Boppin' happened to have a different release of the game that had completely different levels. Now's a good time to mention Tom and I are playing the original old-school copy of Boppin', but this game went freeware several years ago. It's interesting because most Apogee titles are not abandonware. They're still being sold today, but Boppin' is the freeware one that got away. The updated copy isn't worth it though. It got ported to Windows, so naturally it's impossible to run it natively on modern systems. It does have seppuku moves, but so does the original with the code. Also, if you make a mistake, you lose your sunglasses. Not on my watch. Sunglasses make everything better. That goes double for mistakes. They're there to hide the tears. 
I'd like to point out that one of the mechanics, which up until now wasn't really a mechanic as much as it was just an animation, is that whenever blocks fall, your character acts panicked and cowers away from the blocks. And when the blocks fall forever, you are frozen permanently! So there are four episodes in the special edition here, and at the end of each one, you get a boss! This is a really basic boss fight. I think it's kind of good they didn't make it too complicated since this is a puzzle game, and the vast majority of levels you don't need any arcade reflex skills on. So the boss is pretty straightforward. He does take a lot of hits though, which gets tedious. I can't tell you how many times I screamed at this boss. Like, actually screamed. This big huge rabbit bounces around the room. If he touches you, you die. This pattern would be difficult enough to avoid if it was consistent, but he occasionally drops down without warning, meaning it's impossible to predict and dodge. This is after 40 levels, so your lives are going to be in seriously bad shape. To defeat him, you have to grab these blocks, which are, in this stage, shaped like weapons, and hurl them at him. Considering the control style, where you have to hold the spacebar and carefully line it up while remaining stationary before you shoot while still trying to dodge, this is not fun! This entire game has punished you for the slightest mistake, so you're programmed to take all the time you need to be careful and aim so you don't lose your precious lives, and now all of a sudden you have to do it while being attacked, and half of the time you're gonna fail to even throw the stupid things because you're so panicked you won't be holding the spacebar long enough and end up just wasting precious dodging time. It takes 30 hits. 30 hits just for him to even register that you've damaged him. Oh, this isn't even close to my final form, Tom. How many lives he got left? Oh, that's nice. I still have about 70. That's not an exaggeration. It's kind of tough to count, but this boss has around 95 to 100 hit points total. Sometimes this fluffy douchebag will hit you multiple times while you're still respawning. Does this game not give you invincibility frames? Oh, it technically does, but you can't move while invincible, so you can still be helpless to get hit immediately after. Even when I cheated and saved and reloaded so many times and earned extra lives and continue so I could go up against this guy with a more than full arsenal of lives, this guy still mopped the floor with me over and over and over again. You can't save on this level either, saving is disabled. It took me about a dozen tries and about two anger management courses to finally beat him even with all the lives I've cheated out of this stupid game. And then when I finally did it, I did so with one life left. Okay, I guess Tom had a little harder time with them than I did, but I agree, it's kind of annoying. Anyway, after you beat the episode, you get the exact same generic cutscene for three out of four of the episodes. So that's a letdown, but the overall story to the game does not disappoint and keeps going throughout the episodes. So that's episode one. Episode two started off a little surreal for me. After all the rampant fury on my part, apexed by the violent end of innocence that was a boss fight, the game had taken a pretty dark turn. We then cut to the light-hearted hijinks of a family sitcom. And because this game could see the future, they're of course playing on an Oculus Rift or similar model. This is going to be me before too long. It looks like they're ahead of us actually, since he's powering the whole game with some sort of hit pack computer. Actually, I'm simplifying things. I'm pretty sure time doesn't exist here, as Yeet and Boink have transcended that too. And his big prank is that he grabbed his friend's leg while he was playing a video game and spoiled the immersion, I guess? The way they built it up, it was like this epic game of wits, which culminates in, Hey, you touched my leg! followed by a cartoonish implied fight. Yeah, when you consider this as one of the more fleshed out animations in the game, the build up hits that level of awkwardness you can't always find in games. Anyway, long story short is they forgot when they beat the first boss that they should have killed his entire family because in the next few episodes his girlfriend and child come after you for revenge. They go from a cute story about rescuing video game characters that come to life to murdering teddy bears to a harmless prank where they're literally pulling each other's legs, to being on the repeated wrong end of a revenge story that ends in the heroes murdering a small child. Sorry if I'm getting ahead of myself, Ross. I don't know if you wanted to reveal that part of the story yet. Well, in fairness, I think the child looks like the most terrifying out of all the bosses. But you did attack both of his parents, so you can't completely blame him. 
This is how terrorists are made. There's definitely some Sins of the Fathers stuff going on with this kid caught in the crossfire. The last episode, they just sort of phone it in, where you're only reading the correspondence of the people involved, kind of like the book Dracula. Oh, and all the bosses are exactly the same. They're only a texture swap. What's with all these episodes ending with tarot cards? Okay, we're gonna show the ending, so if you don't want it spoiled, go play it now. It's free. So here's the ending. At first glance, this might seem pretty anticlimactic, but what's actually happening is you're looking at the edge of the video game universe, and our protagonists discuss existential philosophy. I was not expecting that. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but listen to some of the highlights. Sweetie's world was ruled by a totalitarian theocracy. People were forced to play in the arcades to forget the hopelessness of their lives. The programmers who created Sweetie wanted him to embody the remnants of their own rebellious spirit. He became enormously popular because he symbolized the freedom that his world craved. He reflected the beliefs of the people who made him real. He could have embodied the freedom that his creators craved. Unfortunately, he lacked the same courage that they lacked. He couldn't question the laws and beliefs that had enslaved his world's people any more than they could. In the end, he became the incarnation of evil that his creators despised. So if you've ever seen the movie Wreck-It Ralph, but wanted a lot more philosophy in the picture, this ending has you covered. Alright, awards time! Best Multiverse. The environments in this game are some of the most varied I've seen. Existential Ending. It's not often you get one of these in video games. I'm all for endings where everything explodes, but if you want to take the high road, this is the way to do it. And the final award? Tom Torment. This wasn't really the plan, but Tom got sucked into this game in a bad way. It's okay, he's free now. So that's Boppin', a sometimes antagonizing puzzle platforming trip of two triangle heads across the multiverse. I wish all games were this interesting. This game definitely gets better as it goes along. Now, normally when someone says something like that, they mean something that starts off pretty good, but its awesomeness is fully realized as you see it slowly unfold. Like an RPG. In this case, I mean something that starts off confusing, annoying, and full of absolutely aggravating, boring gameplay, but then after a while, like all chores, you just end up getting used to it. Like an RPG. Ooh. Okay, that's it. Stay tuned for the next episode, which will be the best game I've played created by a transsexual. Oh wait, that was this game! What? Let's get boppin'! Let's get boppin'! Let's get boppin'! Let's get boppin'!